Photoshop 2023 is here, and today I'd like to demonstrate some of the top new features. Let's get started. Making selections was already really simple in previous versions of Photoshop using the Object Selection tool, but it did have some difficulty detecting more than just people. Now Photoshop can more easily recognize objects like sky, water, ground, plants, and architecture. Simply hover over an object and wait for a moment until it is detected. Or for more precision, drag a box over what you want to select. You can hold Shift and Alt to add or subtract objects from the selection. As you can see, the selection preview is now pink and gives you an indication of which object is being detected. You can select all sorts of objects, but you will still probably need to clean up the selection a bit using Select and Mask. This feature has already saved me loads of time when making thumbnails for my videos, so I'm really happy to see it has been improved. When making selections using the Object Selection tool, you can choose where to process the image. First, you can do it locally on your device. This will be faster, but the selection will be less accurate. Second, you can process the image on Adobe's cloud servers, which will be slower, but the selection will be more accurate. It's not terribly slow to use the cloud processing, and the results are much better, so that's what I prefer. If you are using an NVIDIA GPU, you can also choose to make processing of the object selection tool, select subject, and sky replacement faster or more stable. In previous versions of Photoshop, I did experience some crashes using the object selection tool, so these options are a welcome addition. On the subject of GPUs, if you're having performance issues with an older GPU, you can now select from an older GPU mode in the Photoshop Preferences under Technology Previews. This may be necessary if you're using a GPU from before 2016 or one that does not support DirectX 12 or later. You'll need to restart Photoshop for this to take effect. Moving on to another feature, it's now faster than ever to remove an object from a scene using Content-Aware Fill. The Object Selection tool must be active for this to work, but you can make a selection with other tools first and then select it. Select the object you'd like to remove and then press Shift plus Backspace. The object will be removed and then replaced with the background. There are many instances where the background will not match, so this isn't always the best method, but it works a lot of the time. AI-generated images are all the rage right now, and Photoshop's backdrop creator Neural Filter offers a quick way to generate simple background images using only a text prompt. This is currently only available in the beta version of Photoshop. To give you an example, I can ask for a cracked brick wall, and I am presented with several variations to choose from. These are not stock images you have to pay to use. These are randomly generated and free to use commercially. On that note, anyone else can generate the same images, so don't expect to copyright something you output here. That's not the only reason. If you click on an image, it will be previewed on the canvas. As you can see, the image resolution is also very low. This may suffice as an out-of-focus backdrop behind a subject, but it's not sharp enough to stand on its own. Let's try a couple more prompts like Sunset Sky and City Skyline. The images are all quite blurry and are often plagued with artifacts and mistakes that will have to be cleaned up. Some are even so sloppy that it ruins the whole image. As a thumbnail, this image quality might be passable, but it's nowhere near professional. You might even get an illustration rather than a photograph. If you like, you can add descriptive words to your prompt to get drawings and other sorts of styles. For example, I can add watercolor to the city skyline. As you can tell, straight edges like you'd find on architecture don't fare too well. You might want to avoid any objects or scenes that are too detailed, and just stick to fractal elements like clouds and paint splatters. If I try crowd of people, you can see that there are limitations on what sort of images you can generate. This generator does not appear to have been trained on those sorts of images. It really works better for generating simple patterns rather than complex scenes. If you're trying to generate detailed landscapes, then Photoshop's Landscape Mixer will give you better results. Unlike many of the competitor image generators, Photoshop's filter lacks any detailed parameters you can set to customize or refine the results. That might be by design to make the tool easier to use, but I think it's too simple. It's difficult to get anything usable without sliders to change various aspects of the generated image. The best you can do is use the More Like This button to generate more iterations of the prompt. Hopefully you'll discover one that better suits your needs, but you can also easily hit a dead end on many prompts. 
Or there is also the variety slider, which controls the complexity of the generated image. So in a sense, this sort of randomizes the image as well. If your expectations aren't too high for the backdrop filter, it works pretty well. It is convenient to be able to create a simple background without having to rely solely on stock images. One thing I really like about this tool is that you can build up a collection of multiple candidate images in a session, then select the variations you'd like to keep and output them as a group of layers. The text prompts are even included in the layer names. Adobe mentions that there may be usage limits to using this filter, though that's quite ambiguous. Without any clarity, I'd hate to become reliant on this, only to be locked out of it later or asked to pay an additional fee. Hopefully that policy becomes more clear in the future. While we're on the topic of generating images, Photoshop now includes substance-generated patterns and textures. These are available in the Materials panel. You can start with a basic material and then customize it in many different ways using the sliders. You can use these materials as textures or patterns for backgrounds or anything else. Just imagine how useful these can be for image compositing. Simply make some selections and fill them with flat colors, then apply a material. The materials are a live filter that you can modify at any time, as long as you don't rasterize it. You may also want to use these materials to generate textures for custom brushes. Simply make a selection of the area you want to capture, and then use the edit menu to make a brush out of it. Of course, you'll need to add more brush properties to complete the brush, but that's a topic for another video. The next new feature I'd like to demonstrate is really going to impress you, unless you're relatively young. Many of us only have printed photos of ourselves or our family. These photos may have been taken with a low quality camera and printed in low quality as well. Would you believe Photoshop's photo restoration neural filter can not only enhance the detail in your old photos, but it can also restore damage and make faces as clear as if they were taken with a modern camera? Don't believe me? Take a look at these before and after images from my childhood. Not only are these not great quality photos to begin with, but many of them are blurry. So it's that much more amazing that Photoshop can improve them. There is a limit to how poor the image quality can be. If the image is very small and or very blurry, the filter has trouble recognizing the exact shape of objects. For example, the eyes can end up misshapen or the teeth can blend into the interior of the mouth. A large, high-resolution scan of a photo that is in focus yields the best results, but it's still worth trying on lower quality images. It also seems to have trouble with glasses. It makes the eyes look kind of weird, maybe too sharp. If you wanted a more accurate restoration, you would need to spend considerable time cleaning up these results to correct any mistakes. You can also fade between the restoration and the original image so that it is at least partially faithful to the original. Even better would be to output the results as a layer and then mask it as needed. Unfortunately, you can only enhance faces at this point, but I don't doubt that in the future, an entire image will be able to be enhanced like this. There is some general enhancement you can apply that does a decent job of increasing the image quality a bit, but there will still be a stark difference in detail between the face and everything else. Overall, this filter works great, but the main issue I have with it is that the results are more lifelike, but they are also less real. Even a subtle difference in your face means you are no longer looking at you. Even if this filter becomes absolutely perfect, we will still be looking at a generated image. It will never be reality. One could argue that a photograph is no different. It too is a representation of reality and is subject to inaccuracy. There are plenty of photos of people that don't look like them. So I'm kind of torn on this feature. As someone who doesn't have a lot of pictures from their childhood, I am delighted to be able to connect more deeply with the images I do have. But it also feels like an illusion. I suppose that's something I will need to reconcile if I want to fully appreciate technology like this. Aside from restoring photos for fun, another practical way to use this filter is to restore reference photos for use in portrait painting. I sure do wish I had this filter a couple of years ago when I was commissioned to paint a portrait from a low quality photo. The restoration filter doesn't fix the lighting in the photo, but it does become much clearer and easier to work from. If you paint a lot of portraits, this is an excellent tool to have. I was curious what the filter would do to an already finished portrait painting. As you can see, it sharpens it up a lot. And you can even use it on modern photos as well if you want a really sharp, punchy, surreal effect. 
This technique could be very useful for enhancing screen captures that will be turned into video thumbnails. Although this is technically not a Photoshop specific feature, you can access the Camera Raw filter from within Photoshop, so I'll include it. Camera Raw and Lightroom can now detect objects, backgrounds, and facial features like eyes, the mouth, and hair. When applying effects, you can isolate these areas using an automatic mask. This is incredibly useful for editing photos, so why is it available in Lightroom but not in Photoshop? Here you can see it makes it possible to separate the edits without having to create a mask manually. Here's another new feature that you're going to love. When creating gradients, you can now see a live preview of the gradient and then modify it on the fly. This is very similar to the interactive gradient tool in Corel Painter. You can extend the gradient by dragging the ends of the line, and you can even edit the nodes or the color stops in between. Otherwise, the gradient tool works the same as it normally does, with options to change from linear to radial, choose the color blending method, and so on. This makes it much, much easier to work with gradients. This feature feels like it should have been in Photoshop a long time ago. In fact, I'm really surprised it took until 2022 for this to appear. The final feature we will explore is support for snapping in Windows 11. If you are not already using this feature, it's great. You can drag Windows and now Photoshop to the top center of a display, and a menu will appear that will allow you to position that window on a grid. This makes it really fast to arrange multiple windows. Let's say I want to place Photoshop next to a folder with some images in it. Now I can do that in a snap. If you want to learn more about this feature, I have a video about it. While those weren't all of the new features in Photoshop CC 2023, they were the most significant in my opinion. If you're interested in more Photoshop tutorials, I'll link you to some of my playlists. I'll also highlight my video about how to fix the Windows Ink issue that interferes with pen pressure in Photoshop. You have to fix this every time you update Photoshop. That's all for today. Thanks for watching and stay creative.